so much for having me, Rory. So my thesis project is called Material Matters Beyond the Surface, but before I um, move into the content, I'd like to acknowledge um, and pay respect to the First Nations people of this land, and I think um, it's really pertinent contextualised against my project, which is centred around materials, because um, inherently materials are related to the ongoing colonisation from an extraction from this landscape. Basically, I started this project, like most of you may have, um, in thinking about the climate of architecture, um, but also thinking about ideally how I'd like to practise architecture moving into the future. Um, this project positions itself against a global resource crisis where building materials are in short supply um, and prices are astronomical. Basically, this project also foregrounded my first year working in practice, which was really interesting, interesting sort of like getting a sense of the pressures of my boss, for example, the builders, the clients, um, which, yeah, were all kind of intertwined with um, this way of thinking. I started thinking about like really broad concepts, the dirt, the earth, geology, um, how this can be related to architecture in terms of earthworks and cut and fill, um, but also thinking about these acts as inherently um, political and rather than having this sort of tabula rasa condition um, that potentially some people might believe, um, I guess these acts are inherently related to the reordering of um, communities and ecosystems that are sort of situated on that land. It then kind of foregrounded this interest in materials. I started thinking about um, specification and basically the sort of agency that we have in architecture to start thinking about um, what materials we're choosing um, and how they're related to um, extraction and sort of um, resources. Um, I was thinking about reperceiving materials, but also thinking about um, masonry materials because these um, materials are the biggest contributors to construction and demolition waste, but um, also the materials that have um, the largest kind of capacity to be reused basically in architecture. Um, I started looking into reuse practitioners um, some of which are listed above, Rodar, Superuse, Material Cultures. Um, the images that you see here are actually an interview that I teed up with Amy Co from Second Edition. So before I started my thesis, their project that they did up in Sydney was basically a huge inspiration for me. Um, and so this was actually a really cool um, like point that I kind of um, undertook before I actually started the semester just spitballing ideas and getting a sense of how they tackled their own project, um, which kind of used the same set of ideas. So following on from that, I started thinking about a speculative model for practice. Um, and basically, this was de developed early in the semester, which um, was basically a set of values and processes um, that I thought would foreground my architectural approach. Um, you can see here on this slide, I basically was looking at the stereotypical stages of an architecture project um, and reperceiving them through looking at how some of the other people that um, I sort of showed on the previous slide were operating in this way. So um, the project itself um, was titled Material Matters Beyond the Surface and um, basically I was looking at interrogating um, materials beyond an obsession with surface or image that often as architects we um, kind of look to in order to achieve a certain material result without considering um, I guess the layers that are sort of hidden behind that um, specification process. Um, in the end uh, my project took the direction of using two sites to unpack material use in architecture. Um, and both of the sites were topographically altered by the extraction, production, and manufacture of masonry materials. I was also considering how architecture could be created by reappropriating materials, and also by acknowledging the processes uh, associated with their reuse. So at Albert Street in Brunswick, uh, the disassembly and excavation of an existing house reframed its materials by um, facilitating new ways to inhabit the between spaces within its architecture. 
Geologically, um, the site was on clay soil and formed part of the former Hoffman's Brickworks, which first operated in Albert Street in the 1880s. I began by surveying the existing building um, and gaining an understanding of the materials that formed its construction, which was an existing Edwardian house. Um, and you can see, I mean, maybe you can't potentially read the text easily, but basically I was interested in thinking about where the material was from and then the process that I would use to sort of deconstruct it as well as its like, um, use when it was reappropriated in the project proper. Um, whilst designing and documenting the project, I was also engaging in this reciprocal act of collecting and categorising relics of material use by visiting construction sites around Melbourne. I'm also lucky that I had access to these sites because my partner is a carpenter, so I, I was, was able to kind of access um, and, I guess, get those materials um, from the, some of the sites that he was working on at the time. Um, at Albert Street, the materials were framed against a construction methodology um, of the Edwardian veneer brick house. In essence, the architecture involved the strategic removal of the building's layers in order to create new perspectives and ways of inhabiting and bearing witness to its materials. As one moves through the project, four key elements foregrounded its architectural response, which were centered around the wall, the floor, the roof, and the mound. As one moves linearly through the site, a spectrum of deconstruction is experienced. A mesh walkway um, considers new circulation, which traverses across the floors and into the roof cavity. Movement through the rooms is facilitated in accordance with the original um, planning logics of the home. I'm just going to touch on two of the interventions um, rather than all four. Um, so. The first at ground, as one enters the site, um, the excavation gradually reveals the subfloor beneath, and a reconstitution of the existing floor elements formed a new seating area, which allowed its occupants to witness an assemblage of stumps, joists, bearers, pipes, and displaced earth. In the roof cavity, the mesh walkway sort of traverses into this between space um, but in the roof and the space below. Um, basically, a vitrine was inserted composed of glass, steel and aluminium um, with a new outlook framing the roof cavity beyond. Alongside this, um, again, with materials salvaged from these construction sites, I produced these sort of one to three, one to five-ish scale models, depending on what the materials allowed um, to further interrogate um, the fragments that I showed prior. The second site um, at Geelong Road Footscray involved the modification of an existing iron foundry to host a material depository which stored, processed and sold salvaged building materials. On basalt plains, the new architecture was rotated in an alignment with an existing basalt quarry that was on the site. Four main interventions modified the site, with each program associated with a reused masonry material that had either been deconstructed from the site itself um, or delivered to the site from, um, as a waste stream. The architectural approach was governed by both the use of these materials, um, whilst also acknowledging the process of their deconstruction. Upon delivery, the existing concrete slab was tilted up from the ground. Though permanent, the act acknowledged its own temporality and was supported by steel struts that were bolted into the remaining slab. A new steel structure and, um, and mesh surface partially filled the void that had been left in its place, fragments of rubble and ecology beneath its surface. Materials that awaited transport via an existing gantry system um, within the gridded foundry structure that was extant on site. Uh, sitting beneath the canopy of the existing foundry shed, a new assemblage of brick walls partially um, reconstructed portions of buildings uh, from the site. New openings within the roof canopy allowed these parallel, parallel ecological processes in tandem with the steel mesh platform um, which covered the ground surface. 
It was here that materials were stored and catalogued um, for repair. A continuation of this mesh platform um, facilitated movements into the workshop space. The building's form governed by trusses that had been deconstructed from the site. Salvage roofs, tiles and an ancillary steel structure formed both the facade and tectonic logics of the building. A 12 by 1200 grid allowed these pallets of materials to be stacked internally in the building's facade, um, which responded to this motion of materials as they were moving through the site, being delivered, catalogued, um, and being repaired. Upon pickup, um, the site um, was accessed by an adjacent entry on Geelong Street. Uh, and here, a walled landscape was negotiated, constructed using overpour concrete blocks that retained mounds of dirt, aggregate, sand, and plants. A site office emerged from this assemblage um, with frame infills of timber and steel. Cover was articulated through the use of a builder's tarp, oriented strand board beams and ratchet straps as a provisional structure which were anchored at uh, adjacent ends of the building. I guess since I retrospectively um, producing this presentation, um, I was reflecting on the body of work and I, I guess if someone asked me what the most successful part of the project was, I think I would respond by saying, um, by sort of foregrounding a set of ideas that I actually genuinely continue to think about and that continue to inspire me um, in my architecture practice today. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on a few of them um, before I close the presentation. So the first is thinking about um, architecture as elemental, um, as a sum of its parts, an economy of means by thinking about um, like what's the minimum sort of intervention that you can um, do to kind of achieve a certain outcome. Um, the layering of things and the dry construction of things which are both uh, inherently related to their reuse. Uh, architecture is something that needs to be repaired and maintained Materials and architecture is temporal, um, which are, in, are inherently related to their reuse, um, but also considering the labour and agency involved in this reuse, which, yeah, I guess is often a reason why materials aren't reused um, in general in architecture. Materials is implicated in a multitude of processes. Um, so beyond, as I was saying before, in thinking about the material as a surface or image, it's really important to think about them as related to these um, processes, processes of manufacture, transport, storage, installation, and deconstruction. Um, the site is specific and is embedded with latent conditions, as situated and is embedded with human and non-human actors. Um, and about process, it being non-linear and messy, I feel like for me, I went I took a lot of dead ends. I basically spent half the semester creating a business model and then thinking that I couldn't submit that as my presentation, not wanting to do a building, not having a site. Um, so I feel like if you're in any of these positions now, um, it's all good. And yeah, I guess just embrace that kind of like messiness um, and dirtiness that is a result of, yeah, I guess doing thesis basically. And that's all, thank you. I'm also very happy to uh, share this project, which is called the Park Home. And I hope my project can encourage people like me to continue to explore the possibility of sustainable architecture. And so first of all, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owner of the land which we gather today. And I would also like to acknowledge the Utah Utah people as the traditional custodians of the land which I designed my thesis project. I pay my respects to their early past, present, and emerging, and recognize and honor their deep connection to country and rich cultural heritage and their ongoing contribution to the community. So I just like have a like, little introduction of the Shopton where I designed my thesis project and it, where all of our like, studio did this project is that Shopton is a city at the north of the Victoria and it has the main issue of flooding, heat wave and housing crisis. So basically it has some like environmental challenge and also the housing challenge. And also for affordable housing, it's our like, uh, basically it's the target of the, this design studio. So we're going to like design affordable housing for the people who live in there and trying to, you know, to have like uh, 
have a solution for the hosting request or make, the, it, make it a little bit better. So my presentation will like divide it into seven parts. And first, I will start with this statement. So basically, in the context of Sharpton area facing a significant number of elderly homeless, this CIS is, is aimed to create a multi-phase shared Sydney housing project in the Gorman River flooding environment using the rec recycled local materials with the flood resi resistant design and reconnect the architecture to country to provide an extensive pro approach to the economic and uh, psychological care of elderly homeless. And on the left side is the is the like uh, installation that I create to, to you know to remember the the home and land memory of the Shepton's home because I believe that for nowadays the people who live in Shepton they, they want a home but sometimes as the homeless people they are kind of like you know have the memory have the have that wish they, that they want home so I create this like installation to aware people like to pay attention to this problem and moves on to the project background so as I mentioned that Shepton has like affordable housing crisis because that in Shelton there's there there's house there, but there's not much a livable house for the single people or for maybe for like people who, who just like with the partners or maybe like just homeless people because they only build like big house there and sell it for profit. So which means that the raising of the cost of the housing and may cause like difficulty in uh, to suitable and affordable housing options and also lack of affordable housing and lead to the, uh, and this will lead to the affordable housing crisis. So this is like the, when I went to the Shepton, I think it's Gomba uh, suspension bridge and down from the bridge, there's a homeless, like a shelter or maybe you can just like a sleeping like place for the homeless and they just putting it like close to the river and which is to be really cold during night. And yeah, so that reminded me of thinking when I'm picking up my target group and yeah. And I also like watch the uh, Netflix like uh, documentary which is called The Lead Me Home. And it's like kind of aware people of what, what is like group of homeless. And homeless is not, you know, some mad people, you know, sometimes when we like, you know, walk around the uh, Melbourne city and we, some, we saw some homeless, but some people say they are mad or they are crazy, but like homeless is not, not mad people or, you know, crazy people uh, walking on the street, but they are, they are kind of have their own story and they, they kind of like, like, like us sometimes be very hopeless. So, so basically when I'm picking the target group and I find like there are certain, uh, 305 homeless people in Shepton in 2022 uh, and over the like 20% is elderly homeless and it's, so it's probably like uh, 60 to 70. And so I divided into this like uh, target group into f like five subgroup which is like single and disabled, homeless with a child, homeless only for looking for the uh, like a short term shelter and homeless like part with a partner. And so talking about the site, the site is located at the northwest of Shafton's uh, town center, which is kind of like abandoned site from like even maybe uh, before like 2014. And this site is also flooded. So because Shafton got really like bad flooding uh, issue and this site has been like really bad flooding before and it's close to the Gombe River, which is located at the like, west of this uh, site. And at the, at the left, uh, right of this site, it, there's also a, like a park located there, and it's kind of being forgotten by the residents because you know, this park is it's just like too, be, being too separated. It's, it's not a park like uh, in the core of the residential area, but like, yeah, so. Moving on to this part, so I can, you can see that at the left side is Gomba River and my site is located in, uh, in, the, in the right circle area. And so I did some like, research about the site and I find like, like using JS to mapping the flooding and trying to find the issue and uh, uh, also the opportunity of this site. And talking about the attitude to the flooding, because flooding is, people like thinking flooding is like water, like goes through the 
like the boundary of the river, bond, uh, river line on the map. So flooding is like bad flooding and destroy the home. But actually flooding, uh, according to the Mississippi's like flooding mapping uh, research, flooding is not like, flooding is like river is bracing. Flooding is, is, is very common because river is like nature stuff. But the thing, the problem is that when the people build house in the Shelton, the kind of lack of consideration of this nature, um, how to say it, nature rules. So my attitude for flooding is that we should pay respect to flooding and we should like think about how do we live in this flooding. And so, and then I did some like a site, uh, like material memories, like I kind of collecting it from the site and trying to give me like a basic idea of what this site looks like. And then I did a collage at the left side and also like take some film cameras at, uh, like to record the memory and record my basic feeling of this site. And the left side is like, so I have like three, I choose like three, uh, one, the le left is a site and this one is a recycled um, materials uh, supply and this is Gomer River. So it's kind of like three, like three point in chapter two like to collaborate with each other to, you know, to have that like, very beginning concept of this project. And then moves to, on to the project design process. So at the start, I kind of analyzing the, my target group and I find that for, so for this target group, it's like, uh, so both physically and emotionally, I find that it requires uh, living stability, access to nature and accessibility to place and the social engaging housing mode. And then, from the need to the strategy is that what I'm strategy I'm using to, to design housing for them. And so I like propose four strategy is flexible uh, framework, nature integration, free circulation, and decentralized, decentralized housing mode. So, and then I, I start to think about what's the opportunity of this site. So basically I find that the, there's lots of like residential areas like close to the site, the rivers, there's like greenery, like uh, there's a park at the west side. So I'm thinking about maybe I should bring all of these things together within this site and think about like how can I play with this game. And, and then I kind of like start to have a lot of hand drawings and then finally I propose this uh, messy model uh, development is like, so I basically want people like to enter the, the, the site from the street and then it can like go through uh, the central axis and separate into the whole side. And so, and also like decentralized, uh, like, so it's basically have the central axis and then decentralize it and then have their own way of response to the park. And so next I'm moving on to the design is like, firstly, I'm going to talk about from the neighborhood scale, which is a little bit big scale. So this is like about like the uh, site plan and the site plan reflects the integration of the project site with the existing context. It also responds to the idea of reshaping and local nature landscape. Residents in the areas can access community amenities through the grassland pathway. The project emphasized not only uh, serving the elderly homeless, but also encouraging the cultivation of nature, native plants, improving the biodiversity of the park on the west side and providing a local and easy access to nature. And the ground floor plan, as I mentioned, like ground floor plan, all sharing housing is like located at the like uh, outside ring and the center we have like a commun communal uh, kitchen, communal bakery and a communal uh, like wood craft. So I'm kind of celebrating the communal stuff at the center and welcoming the residents from the whole area to enjoy to this uh, project. Yeah, so this is like, so from the central axis and looking from south to north to, you can see the hemp crate wall and you can see also like the central axis with some native glass and people are like kind of like working towards the, uh, working in a more community way. And then I'm, um, so, basically have the idea of this and I propose like what should this project like works for. So I kind of assume a, like a more like a mode of this project, which, which is like I have like communal, communal garden and communal uh, kitchen and communal uh, produce stores and, guard, uh, and also the uh, like homeless care and how does this being work together to supply each other and also supply the local uh, community, I mean the neighborhood, and also maybe can educate the kids from the whole area. 
And then, so this whole, this project has like four phases. Four phases. So it's like so it's not like built within once. Uh, like just finish it, but like I separate separate it into more like a, a four stages. So start with some basic community stuff, and then expand it more like a yeah like a whole project way. Yeah. Yeah, so this is not, uh, looking from the communication towards one of the buildings, and you can see the hempcrete like materials, and also the people are like enjoying the grassland. So this is basically what I want to achieve in in this project is like trying to hide the project in the park and trying to like uh, trying to link the park, link the nature with my project. And also, for, uh, that move on to the more like small scale, which is housing uh, scale design, and this is like the first floor, plan, uh, first floor uh, plan of the project. And so basically, I did like have a lot of like different plan, but I just show one like floor plan here because this is more like a design for the single uh, outlet homeless. And you can see that they have like their own room and they have communal areas at this side and. And what is a little bit unique is that I have like an ordering which is called a gap space, more like a in Java space. So people like st stand on these balconies can like looking up and down and they can have like a, a common, like a sharing, um, like a more like a semi-public space. So it's kind of like you, you, you can choose the way where you want to be public or private. You, no one are forcing to be public here. And this is like the upper floor, the second floor, and I put also some different community, communal uh, functional space here, and also like a staircase too. You can walk in from the outdoor area. And so this is rendering of the of the gap space, like people can you know talking, like and also socializing, yeah. and also link uh, have the connection to the country. And so this is the section of of the project, and it shows that. How does the how does the gap space and how does the from the uh, public to the privacy and then to the semi privacy works? And the axonometric of this project can show that uh, how does this project link with the uh, neighborhood from the street towards the park and how how do I achieve that? Trying to achieve this that uh, the park is at the west side, the neighborhood as it. As, as, as the east side and trying to like remove the fence of the neighborhood and trying to build a big park. It's not just you know trying to limit my project with the small park at the west. Yeah. And this is uh, looking from the communal garden towards the one of the affordable housing. And so the last one is te living tectonic. And so basically what I mentioned before is I choosing like different uh, like a, more like a Locals recycled building material supply and also uh, GV wooden workers and trying to like link this uh, link this guys together you know to, trying to think about uh, how can they help each other and how can they help to achieve my project because nowadays as like Shanine mentioned like the the building like building materials is, is really expensive and also the destroyed building, building materials could be recycled which is more uh, environmental friendly and also they have like the home memory, they have like the memory of uh, be a home before. Yeah, so, and then <coughs> thanks to my like classmate leave and I kind of discovered the, the material hempcrete which is like a, a material really like Sustainable and also, yeah, as you guys can see here, I, I don't introduce can like look at it like thermal proof, like uh, it's braceable and it's also like very light. And so, hemp crate is, is kind of like hemp mixed with, with lime and water. And I'm using this hemp crate too as the one of the main material of my project. And so I did like a uh, material testing at, at the backyard and also like make heaps of uh, hemp crate sample. But I'm thinking, I'm also like trying to think what can make this hemp crate and what can make my hemp crate a little bit special because then I'm thinking about maybe I can integrate some land memory. So I collected like different material from all over the land try, and also mix with hemp crate and trying to create a new pattern, trying to create a new smell, a new texture like on, of the hemp crate and trying to, you know, celebrating the land memory. Yeah, and so this is like for, oh, it's this like from exercise towards one of the full housing that people are like looking at hemp crate and they have been proud of it and they're being educated at it. 
And uh, living tectonic is like, I'm trying to increase is like uh, the celebrating of the tectonic because I want to expose the tecton uh, expose the tectonic because I want to, you know, to educate people and then, and then because it's also like in the flooding area. So like exposed uh, tectonic sometimes can help, you know, to replace it, to, f to fix it rather than just hide it with some concrete stuff. So for me, like the reason of design this is like, you know, more uh, suitable for this area. And yeah, and I also like this some um, like detailed drawing and, uh, and also a small uh, one to five wooden joint model trying to figure out how does the wood link to each other and how does they collaborate with different textures. And this is uh, another like looking from the community bakeries and you can see the elderly are talking and they are like being proud of living in these areas, enjoying their bright time. Yeah, so for the, for the future version, and also like I would like to talk about how does this project help me and help me to rethink of my designs that before of this, I, I'm more like a guy into Archigram, but like within this project, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, Archigram maybe before is like, I, I want to design some new stuff, like I, I want to be high tech, but after this project, I'm thinking about like, what's the cost of building? What's the cost of design? So I think, yeah, Nowadays, lots of people are like, you know, thinking about I'm going to design new things, but maybe we can like looking back and think about like the old stuff, the recycled stuff, the demolished stuff. And yeah, I would also like thank to my like partners, Fiona, which she has done her uh, project, which is like uh, recycled concrete, which has also given me a lot of like uh, inspiration of how do we recycle materials, how do we like celebrate, re-celebrating these stuff and also, also like to save the cost and save the uh, like, you know, the memories of these buildings, yeah. And finally, yeah, I, th I think that's it. That's all for my presentation.